Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad of Dhammer, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service and jbstechvalley.com, and also now a regular columnist for the Jewish Press. That's right. I write the column Albany Beat, and it's really a pleasure to connect how what we do here and connect how government relates to the Jewish community. Oh. And I tell you, I have the distinct honor, pl privilege, and pleasure of having Assemblyman Richard Gottfried here. He is uh, the longest tenured assembly member and soon to be longest tenured member <laughs> of the legislature. But 45 years you've been in the state assembly. Yes. You, that was your first job. Even, I can't say out of law school because you were still in law school. Right. <laughs> right. You, and you completed your law degree while you were in the assembly. Yep. And that was, that's such an amazing feat, you know, I, because there's so many things going on here at the Capitol, and then you're using it for practical experience, what you're learning in law school, mm -hmm. you're learning, using practical experience. Right. So what was it like way back when, <laughs> in 1970? What, what was, what was, the, le what was the legislature like? Like way back in 1970. <laughs> in many ways, many things were different, but many things were, were the same. Um, the most striking difference, of course, was that at that time we had a Republican governor and both the Assembly and the Senate had Republican majorities. Oh. Uh, and uh, Nelson Rockefeller was governor. Uh, Perry Durier was... Perry Durier was the speaker. Earl Bridges yeah. was the Republican leader in the state Senate. In those days, turnover rates in the legislature were a lot uh, faster because you know, in those days, uh, in the in the political system, you uh, a young lawyer uh, who you know was part of the local political organization would would get a job as an assistant DA, and if you behaved, they would elect you to the assembly, and if you behaved, you would get to come home and be in the New York City Council, and if you still behaved, you'd become a judge. Uh, and so, in those days, someone who had been in the assembly for uh, for eight or ten or twelve years was a, a senior member. Uh, I think the general, uh, I think more members of the assembly today are here because they're really interested in substance uh, than back then. Mm -hmm. uh, the political independence of individual members is dramatically more than, than back then. In those days, certainly among Assembly Democrats, and I'm less aware of how the Republican Party worked, but among Assembly Democrats, it was a system kind of like feudalism. Uh, the lord to whom you were, you know, the, the duke or earl to whom you were loyal was your Democratic Party county leader. Mm. And your Democratic Party county leader would deal with the Assembly leadership and you know, just like a, a duke would deliver knights to the king to fight yeah. in a war, your county leader would deliver your vote to, uh, to the speaker or, or, or the democratic leader. So who was the democratic minority leader of the assembly when you came? At that time, it was Stanley Steingut, okay. who eventually became speaker. Right. Uh, and when we came into the majority as a result of the Watergate landslide in 74, uh, a bunch of us who, about two dozen of our 80-something member majority, were not people who were at all adherents of our local county leader. Uh, and a group of us went to Steingut and said, you know, we are not, you know, led by our county leader. Who was at the time? Uh, well, in Manhattan, yeah. it was... Um, uh, Frank Rossetti. Okay. Uh, and we went to Steingut and said, however, we are prepared to be directly loyal to you. And we would like, instead of you dealing with us through a middleman, we'd like to deal directly with you. And whatever, you know, personnel budget you've got, instead of delivering it to our county leader, give it to us so we can hire people to work in our districts and to work in our offices in Albany. And Steingut was smart enough to say, you know, <laughs> this is a pretty good idea. And 
almost overnight, the, the political structure, again, at least on the Democratic side in the Assembly, was just radically changed. And to this day, uh, almost all Assembly Democrats uh, deal as a, as a conference uh, with the Speaker. Uh, and when he's trying to figure out where he should lead the Assembly, uh, he comes to the Democratic conference and we tell him, you know, we're a pretty diverse bunch, but, you know, he, we tell him where we want to go and he, you know, what we pay him to do is to try, try to figure out a package that will make as many of us uh, uh, happy and satisfied and happy as, as, as possible, which is not an easy task, <laughs> you know, because we come from all parts of the state nowadays. We don't all come from New York City like almost all of us did 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, we're a pretty progressive body politically, but there are some of us who, uh, who's, whose personal Democrats. politics are more moderate or conservative, or, or whose districts are Right, like Bill McGee, different. who represents Madison and Onondaga County, I mean, he's always mm -hmm. has a challenge, and he's always, and he has to align himself with his constituents who vote him in, and on, you know, so. Although on many issues, one of the things I learned early on is that on a lot of issues, you know, New York City residents grow up thinking that everybody from north of the Bronx, you know, is a farmer and thinks completely different from us. Oh, no, Bill McGee's this, uh, is instance. A lot of them are farmers, including <laughs> Bill McGee. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things that, that I yeah. learned early on yeah. is that a lot of rural communities in upstate New York are very poor and have a lot of the same concerns about health care and education and jobs as people from any district in New York City. Uh, and the same is true of a lot of, uh, a lot of upstate cities that really have much the same uh, aside from, policy needs. Aside from conducting hearings around the state, mm -hmm. have, have you been to parts of upstate? Have you been to vacation or to visit or just to, you know? Uh, well, vacationing, I, I, for many years, I, I, we did in, in, in Dutchess County, uh, where my parents had a house, uh, a summer house. Um, have you been to the Baseball Hall of Fame? Have you been to Corning Glass? Have you been I, I, around? I uh, not all that much. Okay. I mean, when I was a child, my parents took us all over the place. So yes, I've been to Corning Glass, I've been to Niagara Falls, but I was like 12 at the I time. Um, vivid memories. Um, uh, but in addition to, to doing hearings around the state, which we try to do, uh, I every so often will be invited or asked by one of my colleagues, you know, could you come to Ithaca or Binghamton, what have you, and meet with our hospital people now that I chair the health committee, or you know, talk to the you know the people at the school of public health right. uh, and you say, you know, in our town, and I will often say yes because yes. uh, you know part of my job is uh, to help out right. my colleagues from other parts of the state. And you drive up there, or you? Well, I because I have limited vision. I when I travel, I either go by train or plane. But uh, so tell us about the yeah. limited vision. What's that about? Um, I don't know how clinically you want to get, but I, uh, I have two major things. One, I'm very nearsighted, uh, like many people, but that is correctable by lenses. Uh, but in addition, my retina does not have enough, as many rods and cones as most people's retinas. And I always say it's kind of like a, a picture in a newspaper that doesn't have a lot of dots, uh, is not going to be as clear as a picture that has a lot of dots. Right, pixelated. Or yeah. today we would say yeah. pixels. Yeah. Um, you know, if, you, right. if you've got 600 dots per inch, it's clearer than 100 dots per inch. I see 100 dots per inch, not 600. So, oh, and that's not correctable by lenses because it's not a focal length problem. So my vision is, I'm told, almost good enough, with glasses, is almost good enough to drive. And my reaction to that is, that scares the pants off me because I don't think people who see a little better than me ought to be on the road. Uh, 
yes. Although, of course, in this state, if you have like zero vision, right. that does not keep you from getting a gun permit. That's right. um, <laughs> you know, just going back to the political landscape that Mark was yeah. saying, it's something I've been around New York, even though I tell everybody I'm 29 years old, but just around at the same time, the Orthodox Jewish community, we are in the Jewish view, has mm -hmm. changed really incredibly because, say, the highest birth rate really in Brooklyn. You mm -hmm. saw the latest news articles in Borough Park, the Orthodox uh -huh. Jews. So, I mean, maybe not in Manhattan. I know that's mostly your district. Uh, but, I mean, just in general, there's more Orthodox in the Democrat side, probably exclusively. Mark is our reporter mm -hmm. on the He knows everything about the assembly. And um, is that changing some of the views? I mean, you get more like the education... Uh, What's the EITC? It's called yeah. income. Yeah. You know, like I say, education more, income tax. Credit. Yeah, that they're yeah. pushing in the Democrat That's Party. Right. Like you were saying, I mean, just because you're a Democrat, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're exactly everybody is exactly right. the same, to right. say the very least. But just the idea that there is a considerable, I don't know if it's considerable to me, yeah. it is because it's been growing at least, yeah. you know, a considerable minority of Democrats that are religious yeah. just Jews and care about mm -hmm. the Jewish community and the. I don't know whether the number of members of the legislature uh, who are Orthodox Jews has changed significantly oh, yeah, uh, over more, the years. More observant uh, Jews in the, in the legislature, East. even in the Senate, than there have ever have been really? in the past. Yeah. Um, and the population is truly booming in Brooklyn. I mean, yeah. yeah. I have the list. Yeah. But yeah I mean, I, uh, we, okay. we spoke with Chuck Levine, who you sit in front right. of. Right. And uh, he's the head of this Jewish Legislative Association. 96% right. uh, right. of the legislature is either Jewish or has a Jewish footprint in their district. Uh huh. So it's really, you know, that's, you know, it, it's every, you know, the synagogues right. are everywhere. Right. But you have the Midtown Chabad in your district, I think. Uh, well, it might be on the other side of the road in Fifth Avenue or something. I'm not, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I have. Well, the garment New, district. Numerous synagogue. The garment, the garment district, district synagogue. district has their own minion. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. You know. yeah. And actually, uh, in various parts of the Upper West Side of Manhattan, there are there is a growing uh, Orthodox population. Yeah. Well, Yeshiva yeah. University is there. Isn't well, it? Uh, also yeah. Lincoln Square Synagogue. Lincoln Square Synagogue. Which we talk, yeah. which we say is Winken Stair, yeah. because it's in the round, and you look uh, over across right. the way, and... You know, Lincoln Stair. <laughs> no, I, so. and and Lincoln Square Synagogue, I guess, was Redone. was born shortly before I was elected. Oh. Um, uh, but even way back then, it was a significant uh, political force uh, on absolutely. the Upper West Side. Absolutely. Uh, my district has moved pretty much south uh, since mm -hmm. then, but. Uh, rabbi Shlomo Riskin, uh, uh -huh. who was, I guess, the founding <clears throat> rabbi there, who is now uh, in Israel, uh, was a an extremely dynamic individual and a and a significant force in the community. Well, way back then, it's good to see that you're part of the Jewish community and that you're part of the Jewish legislators, and that's very important. Um, you, I got to tell. You have been in the legislature since you were 23. Mm -hmm. I guess you don't believe in term limits. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I often say I don't think you want to have a, a legislature filled with people who have been there right. anywhere near as long as I have. But having a couple of us around exactly. is, is you, useful. Joel jo Lentol. Uh, Joel Lentol, Denny Farrell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, I'm... I think the only, well, Joe Lentol and I are the only two members of the assembly who were here at the height of the New York City fiscal crisis, okay. uh, which was also a state fiscal crisis at the time. Absolutely. A lot of a lot of people don't remember that. I mean, the State Urban Development Corporation, now called the Empire State right. Development Corporation, uh, was on the verge of bankruptcy. And, and if that had happened, that would have affected uh, the, the financing of the state and local governments, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's helpful that there's a couple of us around who remember that. You know, that. Mark, I just, it is the Jewish view, so <laughs> and as a rabbi, I have to put in the Jewish yeah. view. I mean, I understand both sides of the issue, but, I mean, the Lubavitch Rebbe also emphasized, you know, again, in this society, really, in American, 
my wife visits, uh, really she's a social work with old age homes, you know, just people shove them off, you know, and these people have mm -hmm. such a resource, my wife just gets talking to them, and the Rebbe yeah. also felt this way, you know, just say, 20 years you're out, 30 years you're out, and you're retired, all right, right. goodbye, right. go to Miami Beach and vegetate, and you always, you're a resource of, because experience means a lot, it's not just the education, what kind of college degree you yeah. have, experience means a lot, and therefore, like I say, just to have a uh, just a, a new a turnover. I mean, just new blood is important. You know, I'm a mm -hmm. good rabbi. You're right and you're yeah. right. You know, that I say new blood is important. On the other hand, the experience means a lot for, you know, to educate yeah. people and collective memory. They don't know what a physical crisis is. And you can mm -hmm. come in there, a person yeah. comes in there, oh, everything's booming in the last 10 years. So therefore, you know, they... Yeah. A couple of thoughts about, about term limits. I mean, a lot of us like to say we have term limits. They're called elections. elections every two years. <laughs> every two years. Um, you know, I just more just for amusement than anything else, I keep track of, of, of the, the tenure of everyone, at least on the Democratic side in the assembly. And about half of our Democratic conference uh, has been there nine years or more, right. and half have been there nine years or less. Really? So, uh, a big turnover. so there's a fairly substantial turnover. In this year's election, uh, in 2014, 13 freshman Democrats were elected, um, and they are a very vocal and, and, and feisty group. Yes, they are. Uh, and the other thing about term limits is that when, when legislators arrive in a legislative body and know that in a certain number of years they're gone, almost from the day they arrive, they're focused on either what am I going to run for next or what job will I get mm -hmm. next. Mm -hmm. And that's not particularly healthy. Uh, and secondly, what it, what it does is it empowers uh, the staff who stay there year after year. And even more than that, it empowers the lobbying community mm -hmm. uh, who certainly stay there year after year. And when you don't have legislators who develop expertise and who develop, you know, confidence uh, about what they're doing, which comes with time, uh, the influence of lobbyists and staff uh, grows enormously. And it's interesting. And that's yeah, that's that not that good. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, I I got it. Tell us, I got to take my reporter's hat off, and I have to just tell you personally, uh, I've been in the Capitol 35 years, and I've never seen anyone who has higher standards, ethics standards, moral standards than you. I mean, you are the epitome of what everyone, every elected official should uh, emulate, and you are well, that, you know, and if I ever, I told this to some people, if I ever heard that you did anything wrong, <laughs> I would I would just leave this place and say there's no hope. <laughs> so well, I I really admire your tenure over these years, and it's really something special. Well, and we shouldn't only thank be you. you know um, since 1976 there have been uh, almost 50 legislators who have left mm -hmm. uh, based on corruption yeah. uh, charges and and what I call legislative bad apples, but. I mean, you are there, there are so many years, and, and mm -hmm. 23, you were 23 when you first got there, yeah. and you went through 23 elections, so or you're going through your 23rd election, yeah. so this is double, you know. Yeah. <laughs> there are quite a few of, I mean, thank you for what you said, but there are, there are quite a few of my colleagues uh, about whom I think you could say the same thing, uh, who are there because they're really interested in public policy, and they know what they're talking about, and they have figured out that if you focus and pay attention to that work, you can make things happen. Yeah, but it's your longevity and how many years. Yeah. And I'm sure that there have been yeah. times over the years you have not drifted. You have not been tainted. You have not been offered anything that you took advantage of. Well, you come here, yeah. you do your work, you leave, you go home to your family, 
I mean, you do what is expected of you, and you're not looking for extra per diems, for yeah. uh, uh, sh you know, setting up a dummy corporation and funneling money into something else like some other legislators. I mean, you are on the straight and narrow, uh, best that I could tell, and no one's ever found anything, so I applaud yeah. you for that. Well. And, and it's not just other colleagues also, you've done it for so long. <laughs> well, and, you, and know, you're, you know, you, you know, you, part of it is what gives you satisfaction in life. Right. And early on, and I'm talking like when I was a teenager, uh, I decided, and it, it was partly when I was 13, John Kennedy was running for president, and I thought he walked on water. Uh, that was your bar mitzvah year. Yes. Um, <laughs> and... I decided that what I really wanted to do in life was to be able to take the things that I think and have them show up in law books. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just consider myself enormously lucky that at a very early age, I found a place where I get to do that. And, you know, it'd be nice if I were paid more, but... There's, I've, I've never regretted being here. I've, I don't think I've ever had a boring day here, uh, some frustrating days, but every year it seems I, I accomplish enough to feel that it's worth coming back. And every year there's enough that I don't accomplish to make me think I better come back uh, to get it done next year, uh, and in some ways it's, you know, it's an addiction, um, but I, 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 I hope, you know, a socially productive one. <laughs> you know, just, I think that, but Mark, one of the issues is that should there be a raise, I mean, maybe that would avert the, the corruption, people just like kind of you said, they aren't being paid enough, and therefore... No, he said he wishes he was paid more. He wishes. More. Yeah, I mean, he didn't say yeah. he wasn't paid enough. He wishes he was right. paid well, more. I mean, yeah. this thing, so that leads to the question, <laughs> would you be for pay raises? I know that always comes up every session. Yeah, I, um, I think it would make sense for members of the legislature to either be precluded from earning outside income uh, or very limited in, in, in our outside income, uh, but I think it would also make sense for us to be paid, you know, roughly what a member of Congress or a uh, or a state judge uh, is paid, uh, which I guess is in around the hundred and fifty, hundred sixty thousand a year range. We are now paid just under eighty thousand a year, uh, and while in some ways that I mean that is you know, more than the, than the median income for a household in New York, uh, for people with the education and experience that I think you would want in a legislator, uh, it's not a particularly sensible salary. Uh, you know, but coming here at 23 and seeing your life ahead of you, you know, mm -hmm. there must have been times when you saw a Senate seat open, a congressional seat open, something else, but you yeah. have been satisfied. You're a contented cat, you know? Yeah. You well, sit there, you know, and, and, and it's not like you, you're at every session, you're in conference, you're, like you said, yeah. from the very beginning, you've been loyal to the speaker, whoever the speaker has been, and you are really, I mean, what makes the mm -hmm. legislature tick, yeah. you, you know, without having these kerfuffles of, <laughs> of bad apples, you know? So. Well, you know, there was one point about, well, in 1976, yeah. when, uh, when Congresswoman Bella Abzug was leaving Congress to run for the U.S. Senate, and you know, there was all this fuss on the West Side, who's going to run for Congress to succeed her? I knew that I didn't have the political strength needed to, uh, to be elected, but I thought, you know, it's nice to have your name mentioned. So I told the reporter for the local weekly that I was interested. And a few days later, after the store, my name appeared in the paper, the lobbyist for the New York Civil Liberties Union, uh, who was a good friend of mine at the time, 
came up to me and said, you know, I saw in the paper that, you know, you were thinking of running for Congress. He said, I'm, I'm really upset to see that. And I said, wait a minute, what, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know, there's a, he said, state government is really getting to be more important than ever. He said, and there's a handful of people like, like you, like Oliver Coppell, uh, who is no longer in, in right. public office, but was for, for many, many years, and, and one of the finest people I've ever known in public office. He said, you know, he named a couple of others, and he said, you know, folks like you seem to have made a commitment to state government and to the legislature, and I'm really delighted at that. And I kind of said to myself, oh. Uh, and those words have been echoing in my brain ever since. Wow. Um, and the other thing that has echoed in my brain ever since, a few years later, uh, when my son, who is now 38, uh, was a couple of years old, I was saying to a member of my staff that I was thinking that you know, maybe I should go practice law or something because, you know, I have financial responsibilities, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, neither me nor my wife was making anything particular much at the time. And what this member of my staff said was, you and Louise, my wife, both do work that you love. Mm -hmm. And it's, and you come home from work happy. He said, and she said, your son is going to grow up a whole lot better having two parents who come home from work happy than who come home from work grumpy. making twice what you do but grumpy. Mm -hmm. And those words, I mean, my son is now 38 years old. Right. He, he doesn't care whether... And he turned out just fine. And who turned out just fine. Um, but those two conversations have just echoed in my brain ever since. Wow, that's so, that, it's getting to know you better, you know? <laughs> I mean, I really never knew any of that. Uh, you would probably define yourself as a liberal? Oh, at least, At yes. least, okay, socialist? <laughs> um, I use the term social democrat, okay. uh, uh -huh. which is a, something of an old term, but it... It's a it, Bernie Sanders type, maybe. Well, he, he, he calls himself a socialist. I would say I, I believe in, a, in an active role for government, yes. So, you know, because you have so many accomplishments over these years. I mean, it's just amazing how many, uh, the health care proxy law, the Family Health Plus law, the Child Health Plus program, prenatal care assistance program for low-income women, uh, you know, you've been very active with uh, uh, accountable care organizations, ACOs, and preventive care and formation of those. Yeah. Uh, the HIV AIDS bill and uh, measures that have come out. I mm -hmm. mean, you don't even represent the heart of that community in the village. You're just north of that. But, you know, you, these, these are very health-oriented, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, measures and gender the Gender Non-Discrimination Act, right. you really are... I'm the sponsor, sponsor of, of And, you know, really a real proponent of. I mean, medical marijuana, you want was to my bill. that, yep. right? So, I mean, I just look at this list and I say, wow, you know, <laughs> what would it have been without you? <laughs> well, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, none of us is indispensable, right. um, but we all do make our contribution. Now, you yeah. served as the deputy majority leader, the assistant majority leader, so that shows your loyalty to the speaker, for sure, when he puts you up in those, in that ranking of an yeah. executive type position. And before you were health committee chair, you were chair of codes? Uh, I was chair of the codes committee in 1977-78. Yeah. Uh, and a tribute to the rate of turnover is that I first became a committee chair in my fifth year in the assembly, uh -huh. and chairman of the codes committee, which is a pretty major yes, committee, uh, in my seventh and eighth year, in my seventh okay. and eighth years in the assembly. Because uh, you were also uh, the children and families, you were chairman of that? Well, that's or? what I chaired in, in my, starting in my fifth year, okay. I was the and first chair of that And then committee. moved to codes. And then I became chair of codes. And then moved to health. 
well, I, I, after Codes, I was the assistant and then the deputy majority leader, okay. and then in 87, uh, became oh. chair of the health committee. And that was after Jim Talon left? Yeah, when Jim Talon, well, when Jim Talon became majority leader, right. he had been chair of the health committee. When he became majority leader, uh, uh, a member of my staff uh, said, you know, Dick, you ought to put your name in for that. You'd be really good at it. And I said, well, all right, maybe that's a good idea. And so I called yeah. Mel Miller's uh, office and he wasn't in, but I left word with a couple of his staff people that I was interested. And I did that in the, on a Thursday morning. <laughs> that afternoon, one of the staff people called me back and said, I talked to Mel about it. He thinks it's a great idea. Tomorrow morning, he's going to be at a real estate agent's office because they're buying a house. Here's the number. Call him there. <laughs> so the next morning, and by the way, it was... Friday morning, May 1st, and this year, Friday morning is a May, May 1st. 1st, yeah. And I call him at about 9.30, and I get him at the real estate broker. And Mel, who is known for being a man of few words, gets on the phone. He says, Dick, you're the new chairman. You know, go down to the office at 270 Broadway. Talon's going to be there. He'll tell you everything. You know, goodbye. And uh -huh. hangs up. And so I called the member of my staff who had given me this idea, and I said this better be a good idea because <laughs> guess what? And, and, that's, and that's he's, what he's I, still on your staff, this guy? Well, it was a, a, a woman who, be, woman. who was on my staff, had been on my staff since 1976 and left uh, to move to Florida to take care of her mother right. uh, in the late 90s. So this okay. is someone who was on my staff for like for a long 20 time. years. And we should uh, say that your chief of staff, I believe, is the majority leader of the Albany Council. Of the Common Albany Council. Common Council, Richard yeah. Conti. Right. right. So, and he's been there a long time. Yeah. So anyway. Listen, to... uh, Assemblyman, you're doing such a great job over here for so many years. And continue the good work well, yeah, with you. everything you do and do it with good health. Thank you very much. All the best. Continued success. Yes. Thank you.